Welcome to Possibility Project. We are a growing community of disruptive change makers reclaiming our power through meaningful sparks, connections, and action. My name is Devin Davey, and I'll be holding space for you all for this episode on talent justice. This is our 20th episode with Possibility Project, and we're well into our second season. And so if you've missed any of the previous episodes, we invite you to check them out on our website. So if I'm going to post our website, and um, all of our episodes are also shared by the wonderful Mickey Desai, who um, is running the nonprofit Snapcast. And Mickey is a wonderful friend of ours and supporter of Possibility Project. And we appreciate him so much for creating space for learning with the nonprofit Snapcast and on his new podcast called The Inclusion Catalyst. So you can check it out. I will add the um, links in shortly. And we'll also share all these links afterwards, so don't worry. Um, so for introductions today, um, for our Zoom introduction guidelines, one of our fabulous speakers previously, Nova Wren, uh, with the Genesis Healing Institute, has shared our, um, our Zoom guidelines of how we like to introduce ourselves. So he's with um, Genesis and has given access to everyone to be able to use it, which is fantastic. So um, I'm gonna introduce myself um, and then Heather. You already know my name is Devin Davey. I use she and her pronouns. And I'm coming to you from lands held and kept secret by the Ohlone and Ramatush people in San Francisco, also San Francisco. Um, I honor these ancestral keepers of the land where I'm now living and I honor their descendants who continue to breathe, breathe life, uh, really sacred life into our earth. So just a small note on territory acknowledgements um, after that intro, we know that it's one small part of dismantling and dis dis disrupting the colonial structures um, and the status quo that, that we're in. So we're gonna share some links with you as well. Um, you can check out where, if you don't know already, where you are um, on your land and share that um, with a link here. And um, we want to note that many of our guests and recognize many of our guests are sharing a US based perspective. And so we welcome any perspectives from other places and spaces. And uh, for anyone who might be differently abled visually, I want to describe my physical person. So um, I identify as a white woman and I have a brown hair pulled back. I'm wearing brown rimmed glasses and gold earrings and uh, a black jacket feeling very formal today. And um, I'm, in a, I'm in a white room. So uh, today you all will get a transcript of our episode through Otter and we will email that to all of our registrants after the event. Okay, on to introducing my amazing co-creator, Heather Hiscox. I'm gonna add her uh, website into the chat. Heather is the CEO and founder of Pause for Change and works with nonprofits, philanthropic foundations, and local government to help them address challenges and pursue opportunities in less time using fewer resources with achieving greater impact. Heather is a rock star, and I'm just so honored to be doing this work with her. And you can check more out on her website here. And my name is Devin, I already told you, I'm a strategy consultant partnering with female entrepreneurs and networks. And I co-design and implement um, people and process approaches. And so I work somewhat as a backup brain or right hand for CEOs and founders um, looking to grow and solve problems. So you can find out more about my work here. And um, on to kind of why, why we're here together and why we started this project. Um, Essentially, um, when COVID hit the US, Heather and I had a dream about making this moment matter. And we wanted to have conversations with folks who were super brilliant and knew how to really make change happen and at scale. And we were having these conversations in dark corners of Zoom about the dysfunction in the social sector. And we wanted to scale that and make it much more widely heard, listened to, and accepted in a lot of ways, all the dysfunctions and hopes in the social sector. So um, this isn't a volunteer effort, it's a passion project. Um, all of our speakers are almost 40 amazing speakers have given and gifted their time and expertise. And so um, Heather and I have also given our time and expertise and we ask you all if you find this valuable to make a gift and help us pay for the speakers time, um, which is something we hope to do in the future. And then also the cost of what it takes to make each 
episode possible. So you can visit um, opencollective.com slash possibility project. You can see the beautiful visual there. Um, it's an awesome transparent platform that allows you all to see how our money comes in and where it goes out. Um, so a huge, huge thank you to all of our donors so far. We've had amazing donors at all different levels. And um, there, are, there are some of their names and some of you are on this call today, which is awesome. So we, we so appreciate your support. Great, so we're gonna talk about our intentions for our time together. And uh, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but we really want to create connections and um, explore transformation starting with ourselves. So we're gonna keep up with that theme today. And we have three fantastic leaders who we're gonna discuss um, talent justice with. And here's the flow of our conversation. So um, I wanna share a little bit about the why behind this topic, how it came to us and how we were inspired by our, our speakers to create this. Um, you'll meet our amazing guests and another member of this disruptive change-making community. Um, then our guests will give a brief lightning talk on the first question around dysfunctions related to talent justice. Second, our guests will give a talk about what gives them hope and what's emerging. And that'll be more of a free flowing conversation. And then we're gonna move into Q and A and ask all of your brilliant questions, everyone on this call. And we wanna hear from all of you. And then we're gonna to go to breakout rooms. A lot of people have asked us, hey, can we dive deeper? Can we get into the juice and the you know, lentils or the beef of this um, topic? And so we, we really wanna give you time and space to hear from each other as well. Um, in the in the breakout room. So that's going to be after Q&A. And, &A. and um, after our, our peer conversations, we'll come back together, debrief and hear takeaways from our featured guests. And um, we'll hear about upcoming episode topics. So with that, I want to talk to you about what's behind this topic. And um, all three of our speakers have really, really inspired this this question and conversation around, you know, what does equity and um, kind of racial justice and um, well-being look like for the talent in the nonprofit sector? How do we get there better, more quickly, in more sustainable ways? And so we've all experienced and heard stories of beloved colleagues who are burned out or have left the sector and moved to tech or government or other places just because they are trying to find a way to do really good work and sustain themselves financially or spiritually. So our question that we're holding for this episode and this topic is really, how is it that the social sector, which prides itself on mission-driven work, purpose-driven work, um, to ensure that all communities have access to equity, dignity, basic human, um, human needs and, and empowerment in a lot of ways, how is it that our sector is really um, not allowing for the well-being of folks to thrive and um, sometimes even survive as we know? So you'll see some of the questions um, that we asked um, previously, you know, who can afford to work in the sector and um, how do we better align our values with our practices? So um, those are topics we're going to dive into today, um, and uh, Dr. Judy, Sherry, and Rusty have all hugely inspired us to think really deeply about this, and so these folks are just amazing experts and leaders in this work, and so I want to get you into an, uh, into an introduction with them and um, get to know them, and then we'll have you all do breakout uh, rooms of two to meet each other after this. So. At Possibility Project, we're a little bit different in how we introduce our speakers. Each are phenomenal, fantastical human beings. And uh, we will post their bios in the chat. I will do that. And also, um, or Heather might as well. Um, but also, we want to share a human story about who each one is and um, you know, how they're coming kind of to this conversation to us today at this point in their lives. And so we want to share an interesting tidbit about each and have them tell us a quick story about themselves. And um, Sherry, I'm going to ask you to go first. So Sherry Dunn is the CEO and principal of It Bomb and uh, is going to tell us a little story about herself. Yeah, so um, 
you all should know that they asked for this. Like I, I did not uh, seek this out. <laughs> so they wanted uh, some kind of unique story. But first of all, I have to tell Dr. Judy, I'm so into your hair. Like I like want it. I would like take it and put it on my head right now. So that's like <laughs> what I'm really thinking about right now is my like total admiration for your hair. Um, but uh, as far as the story. So we're supposed to tell you something that is interesting and funny. So I was on a game show. Uh, I uh, love, I used to love trivia. I say that when I could remember things. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was really obsessed with game shows. And uh, I lived in New York. And I went to try out for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, daytime version with Meredith Vieira. It was actually a very interesting story because the woman who interviewed me did not like me and was not feeling me at all. It was a very interesting thing. And, but the woman next to her who was inter interviewing somebody else apparently overheard the conversation and maybe she didn't like the way the other woman talked to me. But literally when I got home, I got a call to be on the show. It was the weirdest deal. Um, and so I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Daytime version and I uh, won I did not win a million dollars, but I did win. I was a high winner. I'm listed as one of the all-time high winners uh, on the show in the category of, of uh, you know, not the million. Um, but um, I remember the question I went out on, which was about the musical Oklahoma. And I remember I lived in New York at the time going home on the subway going, fucking Oklahoma, because <laughs> that would have been even more money. So anyway. Uh, I am a game show winner. So there you go. There's my interesting story. Love it. I wonder how many people here has, have had similar experiences. I love that. That's so unique. Um, Dr. Judy Lubin, I'd love for you to go next and um, just wanted to share that uh, you are a uh, you have a PhD, an MPH, and are the president at the Center for Urban and Racial Equity, often called CURE. So please take us away with your story. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Uh, Sherry, I, I did try out for Jeopardy. I never made it on the show, <laughs> but we do have that common connection. What I wanted to share, the story I wanted to share is me trying to ski. <laughs> I've made several attempts, but it never quite worked out. And so it's an example of when feeling the fear and doing it anyway, doesn't quite work out and you leave with aches and pains. <laughs> so this was my second time trying to, to ski a few years ago. As I went with a group of friends as part of the, the Black Ski Summit. It's a, it's, a, it's a group that's been around from at least the 60s or 70s of Black folks that get together and, and ski. And so I went with the DC chapter and one of the, actually the time the head of the chapter says, I'm gonna make you an expert skier by the time we leave uh, Lake Tahoe. And I said, okay, well, I'm with you, let's go. <laughs> so I went and practiced, took the lessons. And then the next day he takes me up on the green. <laughs> And when I looked down the mountain, I was like, there's no way I'm going down. So I just, I froze and he's like, come on, you got to get down the mountain. I said, can I roll down? <laughs> can I take the skis, throw them down <laughs> and roll down? And he's like, no. So literally he's skiing backwards. I'm holding on to him for dear life, <laughs> shaking, trembling <laughs> all the way down. We eventually get down the mountain and he says, we're going to do it again. And I said, no, are you crazy? Do you know how exhausted I am from <laughs> trying to get down the first time? And he says, well, you got to keep doing it. You got to keep doing it. And I said, okay, okay, I need a snack. We go get a snack. And I go back up with him. Same thing. <laughs> I'm trembling. Oh, <laughs> he's skiing backwards, holding on to me inch by inch by inch, we get down the mountain. And finally I said, you know what, this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna learn to ski post 40. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> Feeling the fear is not doing it for me. I'm gonna hang out in the, uh, in the lounge and have a drink. <laughs> so that's my story of uh, 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 Haitian descendant 
South Florida, sun loving, beach loving woman trying to <laughs> figure out how to ski. Oh, Dr. Judy, we've all been there in one way or another. We've all been there. You're not alone. <laughs> we got a good claps from Sherry. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Our third featured guest is Rusty Stahl, the founder, president, and CEO of Fund the People. Rusty, tell us a story. Uh, well, thanks you guys for having me, and um, thanks for thanks for the stories, you all. Um, let's see the the one I wanted to show or share is um, that I think you know I think I've always been a bit of a ham, and I try to control it. Um, uh, but uh, when I was a kid, I liked writing poetry mostly bad poetry. And I also wanted to be the front man in a rock and roll band. And so combining those things was like my dream. So I even auditioned once for like a rock band <laughs> that was looking for a singer, but I can't sing. I cannot, I cannot carry a tune. So it's just, my mother still says I have a good voice, but um, it, it, it didn't work out. But in this camp I went to in Jersey, I grew up in Philly and I went to this Apple Farm music and arts camp and you got to take different art classes and they had a big like thing at the end of performance. And my friend Dave, who was in my bunk, played bass and he was working on this little bass riff that was really cool. And so I shared this poem I had written with him um, called Late Afternoon, which was about how when humans finally uh, colonize the moon that we would just bring war to the moon. So it was about, there's a war on the moon in the late afternoon. And um, he put it to music. So uh, we ended up performing it at the end of the summer. And it was my big debut as a rock and roll singer. And the last time I was one. And it was a lot of fun. Amazing. And if we're lucky, you might be able to dig up that soundtrack for us, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to see if I can find the cassette. And if it if the tape hasn't totally ripped. Awesome. Thank you so much. We love these stories here. We're going to take a few minutes and hear from each of our featured guests. And um, this is the same question for you all. Please share in the chat. Uh, we welcome all your thoughts. Um, and I think, you know, I'd like to start with um, Sherry again. And the question is, what does functions do you want to see disappear related to talent in the social sector? So Sherry, please take it away. Wow, like how long do I have to talk about this? <laughs> you have to rein me in, like what, what's- Three or four what's minutes, I'll send you a little love note if needed. Okay, good, because I, I can talk forever, honestly, about this. Um, I think um, one dysfunction I'd like to see disappear, the main one, is that to work in the nonprofit sector, you have to pick about poverty. Um, that is very destructive uh, to the sector. And it's not based on, it, it's based on a faulty thinking. Um, one of the talks that I give is about the history, reimagining the nonprofit. And one thing I do is I trace this all the way back to our origin story of, um, you know, wealthy white male philanthropists who use their money as a way to impact social change and to ultimately change the tax code to benefit themselves. And that who uses that money to enact that, that philanthropy in action, which would be nonprofit work, ends up being um, white women primarily. And those women who start that work generally don't have to be paid. And so culturally, a lot of things that we think are just what it means to be in a nonprofit are actually what it means to be in a misogynistic, sexist structure that did not value women's work. And we still hold that as some sort of value in nonprofit work today, and it is truly problematic. And it is also very destructive to bringing people of color and low-income people into the sector. Um, several years ago, I was interviewed by the Chronicle of Philanthropy about this topic, and I said, you know, for me, I spent over a decade or more in nonprofit work. And um, one of the things that uh, I recognize is that I was losing money 
right? So historically, Black wealth, everybody knows about Tulsa now, <laughs> it seems like there's like 20 documentaries, but um, Black wealth has been diverted in the United States for a variety of reasons. And so not having wealth means that if I take a position in a job like a nonprofit and I'm making less money, it's actually costing me way more than many of my white colleagues to participate in the work. And I shouldn't be penalized in that financial way from participating. Now that is not to assume that all white uh, colleagues have wealth, but when I talk about wealth, I'm talking about plus over zero. I'm not talking about like a million dollars or trillionaire, I'm talking about being on the plus side of zero. And so we know that historically black wealth is, is uh, significantly less and almost negative white wealth in the United States. So anytime a black, Hispanic or low income person chooses to go into the nonprofit space, they are actually having a double hit financially. And that is truly problematic because if nonprofit work is always going to be the purview of the wealthy, which it had been, and that's its origin story, we have to change that. We have to change that dynamic and we have to change our thinking around that. So I'm gonna stop there because then I'll start preaching, so. Awesome, and we'll, we wanna hear more too. So this is a great start, thank you. I wanna to turn to Rusty and I wanna hear some learnings from the reports that you and Dr. Judy have created. Well, thanks. Um, and I do come to the conversation as a white um, cis male and a Jew. And so uh, that's some of, of the identity I'm bringing, including my own limited uh, worldview in that sense. Um, so I don't claim any level of expertise in this. Um, but I wanted to share, yes, what Judy and I uh, and others involved in um, some talent justice research have found. So Fund the People was started uh, to maximize investment in the nonprofit workforce. And with 12 million paid workers, nonprofits employ the third largest workforce in the US, accounting for 10% of private employment, that is non-governmental employment in total. Despite the importance of the sector that I'm sure we all agree on, uh, you know, we continue to face uh, this deficit of investment in the staff. And, you know, as Sherry was saying, it, it, it skews the whole thing along uh, race and gender and other lines. So um, in 2018, uh, Fund the People and the Center for Urban and Racial Equity Cure um, did this talent justice study. Uh, we framed the notion of talent justice as practices that invest in intersectional racial equity in the nonprofit workforce. And we wanted to explore the challenges and opportunities of talent justice. Uh, we wanted to look at both how foundations were or were not investing in talent justice in nonprofits and how nonprofits as employers uh, were or were not investing. And uh, there's a lot of rich data in the report, which you can find in various forms at talentjustice.org. But I'm gonna hit three findings that I think speak to some of the dysfunctions that need to end. <clears throat> so the first is that we found real differences in perception between funders and nonprofits and between people of color and white people. These were in surveys and focus groups and interviews about so differences in perception about the challenges and opportunities for increasing equity in the nonprofit workforce. So we are talking past one another, both in terms of our roles in the sector and in terms of our, our race and our lived experiences. So to advance equity, we have to increase communication and understanding between nonprofits and funders, between whites and people of color, and in all kinds of other ways, I'm sure. Uh, and that's the only way we can make sure that interventions are really aligned with the real needs and desires of leaders and their organizations. The second finding I wanted to share is that funders and nonprofits are making insufficient investments in practices that support workforce equity, particularly we found at the early and mid-career stages. So for example, in our survey, 84% of nonprofit folks and funders stated that competitive salaries and benefits are desperately needed to increase equity at entry-level uh, jobs for nonprofit entry-level positions. 
So that was 84% said that was a need, but only 41% of foundations said they were providing funding to grantees for those purposes. And only a slightly higher percentage, 46% of nonprofits self-reported investing in competitive salaries and benefits at the entry level. So to advance equity, it's critical to boost those investments, uh, particularly at the access and advancement or mid-career retention stages. The third finding I wanna share is that we looked at this practice that grant makers sometimes have of waiting and seeing, the wait and see practice, where they wait to see when there's an executive transition and let's say there's a white woman or man who's been running a place, maybe the founder, maybe not for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, when that transition happens and somebody new comes in who's different, um, funders will wait to see if that person is successful before they renew funding. And that minimizes the quote unquote risk to the funder, but it maximizes risk to the leader and to the organization. And if a couple major funders wait and see, it kills your cash flow and you, you, you fail and you, your organization can tank or you can be readily fired by the board as a failure uh, when it's not at all your fault. So it reinforces kind of racist, sexist, xenophobic and other um, tropes that only white people can fundraise and that kind of stuff. And it sets up our new leaders to fail um, especially women, leaders of color, and we found in particular leaders who have immigrated to this country, um, rather than equipping those leaders uh, to succeed. And obviously at this moment, there are a lot of people of color being um, appointed to those high level positions. And uh, it's uh, really uh, unfortunate that at this moment in our society, when we need to be going all in on investing um, before, during, and executive transitions to give those new leaders a runway for success um, that that kind of investment is not being made and that we're still having to battle the, the wait and see approach. So those are three dysfunctions that we found in our talent justice study that I wanted to share. And I'll leave it there. So, so powerful. Thank you, Rusty. Oof. Dr. Judy, as a leader in creating these reports and um, outside of the report findings, I'm so curious uh, what you see as the dysfunctions related to talent. The one dysfunction I really want to focus on, you know, ties really closely to the work that Cure is doing uh, now and for the past few years, which is focusing on dismantling uh, institutional racism in the nonprofit sector. And it struck me how much the findings from the talent justice study uh, intersect with the findings that we see when we conduct our racial equity organizational assessments of nonprofit organizations. So many of the things that Rusty already mentioned, we see, but we really hone in on through a racial equity lens. And so there are two, two dysfunctions as it relates to the ways in which racial equity are showing up that really clearly um, point to the need to investing in talent justice. And I would even argue that we don't get to talent justice without uh, a focus on, on racial equity because of what we're seeing in the assessments that we're doing with organizations. We um, have done over 12 um, assessments of nonprofit orgs small, mid-sized orgs um, with some as, as little as, as, as 30 to 40 um, staff and some with several hundred people within their organizations. And we see the same consistent patterns across the board. And two of these intersecting dysfunctions, if you will, that I see playing out relates to organizational culture and policies and practices, particularly as it relates to retention and advancement of black and brown staff. Uh, in the talent justice study, people of color were more likely to identify organizational culture as a major roadblock to their advancement in the sector. And similarly, in our racial equity assessments, we see this playing out 
um, in the form of white dominant or white supremacy culture, showing up as power hoarding of information and decision making, nonstop uh, uh, work driven by funding cycles and leadership's desire to scale up and bring in more revenues while burning out staff, whitewashing and silencing of the voices and perspectives of black and brown staff and a rush to get things done or to, to show movement on an issue, especially around racial justice and racial equity issues when the organization and staff would benefit from slowing down and moving at the speed of trust right, slowing down to, to do the relationship building, building trust and the deep listening that has to happen. All of this is occurring in a context that can be isolating for uh, staff of color, for LGBTQ folks, for immigrants, and for women of color in particular, because we predominate in the sector um, itself, but that women of color are often um, bearing and holding the emotional labor of not just representing for that group, but also leading the equity work. That can be um, exhausting, particularly at a moment where we're experiencing racialized trauma um, almost every few months at a level that just is not sustainable while folks are trying to lead their organizations or support their organizations through, through racial equity and other important work. And so a lot, of, a lot of folks, particularly women of color are tapped out and, and burned out for all the reasons um, that I just mentioned. And then the second way that I really see racial equity, uh, inequity playing out and impacting organizations' ability to practice uh, talent justice is in the area of retention and advancement. When we look at the talent justice study, we found that nonprofit staff of color were less likely to have opportunities for training, mentorship and sponsorship all of those things that are important resources that help employees advance in their careers. And in almost every organization that we've assessed, we see the same thing. We just finished two reports um, in the past, past week where it's the same dynamics uh, being played out, particularly in a context where the pathway to promotion within the organization is not clear, which we see in a lot of orgs, even ones that are well-established and that have been around for for a while, it's not clear how you advance internally, but that has a particular burden for staff of color and staff from marginalized um, populations, right? Being able to, to navigate and have the support and the resources and the mentorship and access to the training um, and, and supports that you need in order to advance and ascend in your career or ascend to leadership. And the question around uh, ascending to leadership, right? This was one of the, the third areas that we focused on in the talent justice study is sort of what are the supports that um, new, new leaders need when they go into uh, move into leadership positions. And almost all the organizations, except for one, all of the leaders are, are, are white. And so we not, we're not even seeing the advancement in the organizations that we're, that we're working with where we're seeing leadership at the top top of the organization. So those are just a few of the dysfunctions um, as we're looking at the ways in which racial equity intersect with talent justice, right? That we can't get to talent justice without a clear focus on racial equity. Ooh, thank you. That's so powerful. I, I, wanna, I wanna turn to Sherry and hear what's on your mind. Uh, here we go. So um, what's on my mind is just that the, the consistency of all these issues. So I have been in the nonprofit space for a total 20 years on and off. I started as a legal services attorney working in legal services, worked in philanthropy as a funder, ran a nonprofit, one of the few Black people to actually run a nonprofit. And I can tell you the complex nature of that dynamic. A couple of things, I'm a big believer in making the unconscious conscious. In other words, if we put on top of an unconscious understanding framework, it's not gonna hold up unless we're aware of what's underneath there that keeps uh, digging at the roots and causing problems. And one of the things is the power dynamic around who receives services and who's in charge. Now I have an equity consulting practice and I work with for-profits and nonprofits. And I can tell you some of the hardest work I do is with nonprofits, not with for-profits. With for-profits I have found they're like, yeah, we're probably racist, you know, let's get going, I don't know. But with nonprofits there is this reflect, reflective uh, hesitancy 
who really acknowledge the issues that are inherent in the work. Um, when I came into nonprofit as an executive, a CEO of an organization, it was very clear to me that many of the people I work with were only comfortable interacting with uh, Black people and people of color in a position where they were dominant and helping and the person of color needed help. They had never interacted with a person of color where they were equal or the person of color was in charge. And that dynamic is very prevalent in nonprofit space. And calling that dynamic out is really hard because in nonprofit space, people say, well, I'm doing good, I'm here to do good. They are so less inclined to hear as a for-profit company about how those power dynamics are showing up. And, and consequently, a lot of racial stereotyping that people actually have toward their client population or the people who receive their services, they bring to managers, CEOs, and other people of color working in the organization. And so we don't discuss this foundational uh, clash uh, that shows up in the nonprofit space. And without doing that, we leave something unspoken. The other thing is in nonprofit spaces, we are very comfortable talking about leadership for women, particularly white women, but we're very uncomfortable talking about leadership issues around race. It is an unspoken elephant in the room. And because that goes unspoken, all of the programming or mentorship in the world is not going to change until we acknowledge that there is an inherent uncomfortability with people of color in leadership in particular roles and, and just in roles where they're not normally the, those being helped in the space. Um, there's some research that uh, I like to refer to uh, from uh, Shelby and Rosette. I actually have my, my little uh, thing so I can tell you who they are. But there's a concept uh, called goal-based stereotyping that explains uh, explaining bias against black leaders. It was some research done by Andrew Carton from uh, Pennsylvania State University and Ashley uh, Rosette from Duke. And they really dig into uh, how goal-based stereotyping tends to move the ball for people of color when they are in leadership positions. And this type of stereotyping is something that is happening subconsciously and it's based on bias. And, and by leadership, you, you don't have to, I don't, doesn't mean you have to be the CEO. You just have to be in a position that you normally are not in. And that stereotyping is an overlay on the work. And so to a, to a certain extent, when I think about nonprofit spaces, I think we need to, and this is why I talk about reimagining, we need to reimagine the work. We need to set aside the structural design of how we've been doing the work and move to another structural design to reestablish new foundational uh, interactions because we are so steeped in a certain understanding of what it means to be in a nonprofit. And, but, and you can see this in the fact that there are people within nonprofits who get upset when you talk about better pay or better benefit. I had somebody at, when I was running an organization who was like, why do we need health insurance? I mean, she was like mad about me trying to, because she, had, she was a, a white retired woman for whom this work was, you know, God's work. It was, you know, ladies who lunch work. So she did not understand this as a business. And the big rap on me was I was running this too much like a business. Right. So this is the kind of day to day things you have to fight out if you move into the nonprofit space trying to bring a new mentality. And so we have to acknowledge that and we have to push the nonprofit space to move beyond its structural foundation. So I'll stop there. Amazing. Amazing. I want to lift up what you said around reimagination. And I do want to turn to Rusty or Dr. Judy next. And before I do that, to just round us out on dysfunctions, I want to share two comments in the chat. One from a participant sharing, as a person of color, I found professional development very difficult to obtain in legal services. I found outside funding to go to important trainings. I saw mentors of color spend 10 plus years at the organization and never be promoted to executive ranks. Another share is uh, white saviorism is real and not always recognizable to white people who consider themselves as allies. I'll pause there and turn it to Rusty or Dr. Judy and then we'll move to what's emerging and the flip side of the spectrum of what's giving us hope. Wanna say anything, Judy? <laughs> Oh, where do I start? Sherry just laid it out. <laughs> just really laid it out for us. Um, just to sort of pick up on some of those 
those themes, right, that um, in terms of reimagining, right, is the, the need to reimagine every aspect of the sector, especially nonprofit within nonprofit organizations. When we do assessments, we look at not only organizational culture and their commitment to equity issues, but we also look at building the need to build a shared language and analysis, right? So even the, so that, that, the idea of, of what does it mean to be in the sector trying to create change and moving beyond sort of that white saviorism that folks have mentioned, right? And be, moving beyond um, sort of the, as much as programs and services are important, but that recognizing the moment that we're in where folks are really needing and wanting to see transformative change, right? And so it does push or is, or the call is to push nonprofits, right? To, 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 to reimagine what is possible and the work that nonprofits can do, right? And so it's, it's a, a building of a language around, around opp of oppression and liberation within organizations and seeing the, the internal workplace and culture as sort of that uh, uh, place to practice uh, liberation, uh, freedom, equity, and justice, right? The same values that our organizations have often been founded around, but we don't see those, those values in practice within the organization. So we have a lot of groups that we work with where they, they are happy and proud to be out talking about racial equity and equity issues. And then you look internally and it's just a mess. It's a hot mess. Um, and, and, and so that deep work of internal change and transformation and embodiment of, of justice has to happen um, internally. And so much has happened, right? Just even in the past few years from when we did the talent justice report. And so we're even seeing, seeing even just within the past year, right? Post the murder of, of George Floyd. Now the conversations that we're having internally within um, organizations that are going through these change processes. Before we were having what white staff was crying. Now it's black and brown staff crying and breaking down in racial equity sessions and, and trainings. And so there is a need for trauma-informed um, processes and collective care within our organizations as well, right? And so how do we make sure we're creating the space for that type of support and holding of people's trauma and the same people that you're asking to lead <laughs> the transformation work? And so I think um, as we're talking about like not only the need for like the fun funding, right, being a key part of this, right, is that funders need to recognize the importance of the transformation work that, that is happening and that needs to happen internally within organizations and to, to, to provide that space um, of, of support um, for the training, for the affinity groups, for the professional development, a mentorship and sponsorship that, that needs to happen in a holistic and um, um, really talented, uh, a targeted way yeah. to be responsive yeah. to the needs of the sector, but particularly to the needs of marginalized of staff um, that has that are that are experiencing marginalization, but are also like really, you know, as orgs are trying to center our experiences to not tokenize us um, in that process. And to understand like that, the work of dismantling oppressive systems and conditions even within the nonprofit sector is going to take time. Yeah. That yeah. as much as it is urgent work, we're holding the tension that it takes time and that it takes intentionality um, and care that oftentimes the sector doesn't have, right? Because sometimes it's, 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 it's based, what we focus on is based on funding cycles and that's the thing that I think really needs, one of the things that needs to fundamentally change and shift. Oh, yes. Yes, Dr. Judy, I wanna lift up what you said around trauma-informed practices. Um, in 2020, Rachel Dietkes, who is a, um, a macro uh, social worker, macro-informed social worker and, and design designer, um, did an episode with us. Um, and a few of her peers and um, was talking about the powerful need for trauma-informed practices as well. So that's a great episode we can link to. 
Um, because it's a theme that we see throughout all of our all of these conversations. Um, thank you for those of you who have been with us for previous possibility project episodes. We spent a little bit more time on this section than we normally would have. Um, next, I do want to move to what's emerging and giving you hope. And please ask your questions in the chat. Um, that's the next part that we're going to talk to our featured guests with. So Rusty, would you talk to us about what's giving you hope about talent justice and work in this space? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is well, you know, there's a lot of good people trying to change things, and people are in it for the long haul. And that's, you know, like Judy was saying, that that's what it takes, you know, urgency and commitment. And, you know, Andrew, who's on here, helped create Equity in the Center, which is an important initiative in the sector that has helped to bring racial equity issues to the fore, um, you know, and um, CURE and, and other groups are doing that work, uh, Building Movement Project, which has been referenced in the uh, chat and their race to lead work, I think even before everything that's happened over the last year and a half, um, really helped to start um, lifting up these issues. Um, so there's good kind of research out there, you know, and that's not even a quarter of what's out there. There's, you know, there's speakers who are really being highlighted on the conference circuit. There's, um, th and there's people inside foundations, you know, everyone should remember that are, are change agents and who are trying to do that hard work internally and, and the same in nonprofits. Um, yeah, I, I've been on two boards I want to reference. One I'm on now, no, no uh, health insurance, no benefits for staff. And it's just been hard to get them to move. But the other one I was on for six years, um, we, were at a, we were revamping the personnel policies and we were adding some benefits and, you know, some sick leave and things like that. And one of the board members kind of offhandedly said, you know, well, let's approve it and hope it doesn't get used because it's going to be, you know, expensive. And another board member said, well, you know, I live with like a chronic, you know, problem. I, you know, I don't know what it was, a disease or a sickness, health issues. And um, I don't think we should, if we're going to approve it, we should encourage people to use it <laughs> as much as possible, um, not hope it doesn't get used. So, and we were able to transform the personnel policies and, and give raises. And that was an organization, like you were saying, Sherry, where only upper, upper middle class women worked and could afford to work. Um, the ED at one point confided in me that, you know, she had some kind of trust fund from her grandmother or something, right? So this was a progressive left leaning organization. Um, and, you know, I think we, me and other board members made the case that we're never going to make this a place where, you know, other people who aren't upper middle class or upper, upper or rich, whatever you want to say on that part of the scale, um, white women are ever going to work. <laughs> and so um, it expanded as we made those changes, you know, we we're spending more money on people, but they managed to go from a staff of three to now it's like a staff of seven. Um, or even more. And it's become so much more like robust as an organization and so much more diverse racially and otherwise as a team. So hey, that's another thing I've lived through that is giving me hope. All right. I'm, I'm jumping in, I think, next on what's giving me hope. Uh, what's giving me hope is that we're even having this conversation. <laughs> It's been a long, lonesome road in uh, nonprofits from when I graduated from law school a very long time ago uh, to today, you know, and I feel like it's just been moving through quicksand. And I, I really feel the momentum and I feel that people are actually asking this question. And uh, as Rusty said, you know, Building Movement Project was on this a little uh, before. Uh, 2016, I actually was part of one of their focus groups uh, of nonprofit leaders. And 
So just the conversation happening publicly is giving me hope uh, and that more voices are coming forward. And then also the change in uh, a con thinking about philanthropy, right? So going back to my origin story, philanthropy, you know, starts with robber barons, wealthy robber barons, and they actually start running the boards and they control all aspects of the dollars because women are running the organizations and women are too stupid to understand how to manage money. Like seriously, like that is a lot of how we still think of board organization work. And so foundations took that attitude also that they have to have super level of oversight over nonprofits because we're, you know, I'm not a professional. I lost all common sense when I walked in the door of a, of a nonprofit. That has changed. That is changing. We are seeing trust-based philanthropy getting some air. We're seeing organizations shifting how they give. We looked at the, see the major changes at Ford Foundation. I mean, given its history and its current leader, um, you know, I am doing a project with Microsoft Philanthropies where uh, we have uh, put money into Black-led organizations that are working in tech, tech skilling, and we follow all the elements of trust-based philanthropy for that project. It is $100,000 a year over three years, unrestricted funding that they can decide how they need to use for their mission. Um, and so as more players start to move into this space and start, because that's a foundational piece, right, of everything else is the money. And the money has to allow people to, to be used in the way that it needs to be used. I can't, you know, we need to start exploding the overhead myth. It's a bunch of nonsense. You know, overhead is people, it is resources, it is training, it is healthcare. I mean, the only reason we think that a nonprofit should run at such a low overhead is because we assume people can afford to work there, which is again, uh, a problematic. And so I, you see these things changing, the, the larger players coming into trust-based philanthropy that starts to trickle down, that starts to change how we think about funding, that, that provides an open runway. And then of course, COVID, honestly, COVID, all these funders were like, oh, I think we better give people money for what they need. Whoa, imagine that. And so, you know, if we can use that and leverage that to continue that momentum, that can, for willing partners in nonprofits, begin to uh, continue to change things. So, you know, just the fact we're having this conversation and how philanthropy is finally looking more at trust is what's giving me hope. I will pick up on on both with what Sherry and, and Rusty shared in terms of seeing the, the shift in power that's happening slowly, but it's it's happening. Um, and I and I do think the 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 trust based philanthropy is a good example of that, where we're seeing foundations um, taking more of a hands off approach and trusting um, organizations, trusting black and brown leaders to make the best decisions uh, for their their organizations. We at Cure are, 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 are beneficiary of, of that example of where we do receive funding. Um, that is very much, you all do what you think <laughs> you need to do that would be most supportive for, for Cure and the work that you're doing around, around racial equity. And so that gives me a lot of hope. Um, also with the change work that we're seeing, just even the demand Right, the recognition that um, racial equity uh, needs to be practiced internally, needs to be um, embedded within organizations uh, being, being so critical to how the sector moves forward, right? Just even just a couple of years ago, how difficult it was to have some of these conversations within organizations and how uh, now, like the ground has shifted quite um, significantly where, you know, there is an opportunity on a level that I don't, I've never seen to really make some fundamental shifts within the sector and also to maybe see different level of results for the communities that are being served in part because of the shifts in funding, what's, what's even being funded, right, um, as part of this conversation in terms of organizing and and advocacy, so the space that's being created for um, for innovation and creativity 
um, to happen, I think is very, very inspiring. And then also to, to see black and brown staff really um, moving into their full power as a result of these conversations and the advocacy that's happening outside of organizations coming in, in turn, you know, coming in internally and folks being able to say things that they never thought they'd be able to, to say within the workplace and, and not feel like, you know, their job security is on the line, right? And so I think um, the recognition that if we are going to transform our organizations, we have to create spaces for, for honest, authentic, real, deeply uncomfortable conversations that need to happen in order for real real change to be um, materialized. Ooh, so juicy. I know all of our brains are tingling with thoughts and questions. And so I wanna move to some Q and A and I wanna start us off with one question that was shared in the chat and please add more, um, Heather, if there are other ones that you see, please uh, I'll turn to you after this. And whoever feels called to speak to this out of you three, um, Lara, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, shared when an organization is built on white savior saviorism, can it be changed or do we need to blow it up by replacing them with new organizations led by the communities that they are serving? And this is for any, any one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can start off and say it's a, a both and, right? Like just even looking over the past few years, especially um, the, the leadership that's come out of the movement for Black Lives, um, seeing right how powerful new organizations that are not tether tethered to the power structure, you know, and oftentimes the power structure that you're trying to dismantle um, is able to like push and move and say things in ways that organizations that have been around for a while and have become institutionalized uh, may not feel as liberated to make the set of demands that um, some of the newer organizations are making. At the same time, right, like we work with a lot of the sort of <laughs> entrenched groups that have been around for a while almost all of them um, have white leadership and almost all of them uh, ex ex display that, right? White saviorism. So getting people to see that just because you're serving black and brown people does not mean you're practicing racial equity or that you're working for, for justice um, and liberation. And, and so with those organizations, right? Like that's the deep transformation work that needs to happen that we're not necessarily trying to dismantle them because they are doing good work. They have, they have, they have a, a, a reach and institutional knowledge and practice that has been built. And so how do we um, redesign and reimagine those organizations in a way that centers racial equity and justice? And oftentimes that does mean a transition in leadership, right? We have orgs that the same person's been leading for 20, 30 years. Um, and so it's not, it's only in the, the, the racial equity work that there is that sort of real deep realization, like, okay, maybe it's time that I make space for, for new leadership. And so both and for me, right? Like how are we making sure we're supporting and resourcing new organizations, the creativity, the mobilization, um, the deeper or, or different level of analysis that new, um, grassroots community-based orgs are offering. And then for the institutionalized groups, how do we also lead them into transformational work that where they are in partnership, right? Because it's not an either or. It's that a lot of what we're doing at Cure is trying to help some of these more institutionalized organizations power share and collaborate um, more intentionally with grassroots organizations that may have a more deeper knowledge or uh, relationships in the communities that they're working in. Yeah, Jay. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with all of that, and I guess I you know when when I do consulting, what I what I like to tell clients is, especially well, mainly nonprofit clients, not my for profit, but I like to tell people I'm all for burning stuff down, but I'm not going to burn down your house with you in it, right? So, in other words, 
I would like us to build a structure where we're going to get over there and then burn down the old structure. So there is some element of that that has to happen, kind of this psychological movement that may mean the shift in leadership, that may mean a board shift. I've worked with two, I've been on a board and work with an organization where the entire board was asked to resign. <laughs> And that is a substantial, you know, it, it maintain, it's maintaining the structural concept of the organization, but shifting. So, right, so they're, think of it as setting small fires um, and then uh, getting people into a new space. There is that. And I think it is uh, both and. But there are some things that I've come to recognize where I think, think of the uh, Audre Lorde quote, right? You cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. And there are some organizations for which that is in fact true. And the only client I've ever, I've quit was a nonprofit because I was like, this is, this is ridiculous. Like, and unless I do this, unless I quit this as a consultant, you're not going to take this seriously. And it was in fact my quitting that caused them to take it seriously and have a transformation of their board. Right. So there, there is some, it's a feel thing. Some people can be moved to a new home while you burn the other one. And some people, you have to set that whole thing on blaze, right? And so it's hard to know which it is, but you, you understanding the dynamics of what is possible. And yes, you do want to maintain that integrity, that reach, that historical knowledge, but you have to get people um, moved over to a new accommodation if they're really going to change. Ooh, so fantastic. This is so juicy. Uh, Rusty shared in the chat the overhead myth letter, which is great. We'll share that in the resources. We do need to move to breakout rooms, but before I do that, I thought maybe Rusty or either Dr. Judy or Sherry would have one quick thought to share on this question. And it goes back to what you brought up, Sherry, around boards. And the question is, how do we change their perceptions around equity? so that they're making positive change from the top. How do we change their false beliefs that only white men can raise money? Rusty? Well, I mean, I don't know it's a complicated question. Um, you know, I think one practice is to not, you know, um, Dr. Judy brought up the term tokenization before, I think, you know, one important thing is when doing board recruitment is not to recruit one person who's different, but to make sure you're bringing in, you know, at least three <laughs> people who share some, some traits or some differences so that they, you know, at least have each other in the room um, and that they become more of a block of, uh, of, you know, some different maybe lived experience or at least some level of perspective. Uh, and obviously just because somebody is one race or another or from someplace or another doesn't mean that they aren't gonna agree with other board members or gonna bring a particular lived experience. So, so I think, uh, and then, you know, I think it's another thing I've heard, I think that was important is to think about it takes time for board culture to change. It takes cycles of board recruitment to set your set your goal five years out. We're gonna, you know, and that, that seems long and then maybe too long. But if you're talking about changing boards, you gotta have term limits and you gotta recruit and you gotta think about it in, in cycles. How long are your board terms? If you don't have board terms, it's gonna be really difficult to change to make those changes. Um, but how do you make the case to people who are there now? Um, you know, I think we've got to get out of the bullshit of trying to, you know, figure out like a business case for diversity. I mean, getting into those kinds of conversations are sort of these rabbit holes that, I don't know, maybe other people are successful at it, but I've seen that just become like a cyclical conversation that doesn't really move people. So I, I don't know the answer, but um, that's some of what comes to mind. Well, I just want to jump in and add, I think one thing is um, nonprofit boards, um, you can't fire everybody and you can start it again. I mean, you can. And you actually, most states, you only need three or four 
specific officers, we need to really reimagine that whole board situation. That's some like plantation stuff, right? The way boards are structured in a lot of ways. We also can move money from power. In other words, we can disconnect the management aspect of the board from the fundraising aspect of the board. You can use committees for fundraising and um, they don't, they can have a board member on it, but we can use the, the, the traditional board, the oversight board for a partnership relationship with management, a nonprofit, right? There's a whole nother way to think about board management and service that we need to step into if we are gonna be serious about an overall transformation of nonprofits. And so as long as we keep trying to, that, that is one area where I am a big fan of blowing some stuff up because these incremental changes with boards, just they just seem to circle back. They seem to keep feeding themselves in this way. So I think, and there's a lot of interesting work being done around looking at how nonprofit boards can structure themselves differently. Remember, we write our bylaws of which we are beholden to. The state doesn't write our bylaws. We come up with all that nonsense, that super complicated nonsense, and we can get rid of it. And so that, you know, my thing about nonprofit boards is to think differently about it as a co-power sharing model between leadership and the organization and disconnect money directly from management oversight. Ooh, such wonderful points, such wonderful points, such great questions. Thank you all. For the next few minutes, maybe five minutes, uh, we're gonna share takeaways in the chat from everyone and from our featured guests. We're gonna hear from each of them to share what parting words and final thoughts and um, words of, of brilliance that they wanna share. So whoever feels called to take it away, feel free out of Rusty, Dr. Judy and Sherry. Well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll kick us off because I'm really inspired by my breakout group um, with Marcus and Tracy. That was awesome. Um, so um, what I wanna say is I, I am hopeful that we can move from a model of a, a business model of nonprofits that's based on exploitation of nonprofit workers to uh, a model that unleashes the incredible talent and, uh, and, and, and diversity and energy and power of people who um, may not yet be visible, may not have positional power, but are there, are, are, are there and are doing the work and um, need to be recognized and and uh, let loose on the world. And um, thank you too for uh, convening us today and for, for having me and having this conversation. A few quick takeaways from me is I'm really sitting with uh, Sherry's call, so to speak, to burn things down when necessary. <laughs> and so I really appreciate that in terms of, of where there is opportunity, right? Or sometimes you have to make the opportunity. And that's what I'm hearing from that is sometimes we restrict ourselves in, in, in being able to see what's possible and how do we challenge existing um, power structures. And so that's a, a, a theme that I think is, is, is resonating with me. Um, in terms of, and, and uh, Devin mentioned, right? How do we learn from COVID, right? Seeing the ways in which we can respond in a time of crisis and need. And so how do we create the systems, the structures, the organizations that actually prevent the crises, right? And so this is a moment to build up um, the organizations and the foundations and the relationships um, to be able to take care of each other and to have a functioning, a well-functioning social sector nonprofit organizations um, that are able to really fully leverage all staff, black and brown staff, LGBTQ folks, marginalized staff to really fully leverage their power and capacity to, to create change and transformation. This is the moment, as Dr. Judy says. Sherry, take us home. Yeah, uh, keep hope alive. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like for real though, like that's what it is about. Like 
continuing to believe it is possible to transform and reimagine the nonprofit and pushing. You know, my undergraduate degree is in the history of philosophy, which is why I'm always talking about the unconscious and this and that, because it's really important that we surface this, right? It doesn't have to be this way. Things, things are the way they are for a whole host of historical reasons. They don't have to always be that way. And we have to have that mindset of change and growth and iteration. We don't, you know, talk on the phone like it's 1800. We don't have to run our nonprofits that like that either. We can chart a course towards something new and we all can be empowered to push that within our organization. It, you know, if you're in fundraising, we talked about this in our group, maybe link up with a local association of funders and try to talk to them about how can they help you talk to funders, right? And talk to staff and, you know, really try to figure out how we can keep pushing this change. Because I would love to see this change, you know, in my lifetime, uh, because it's just very important to me. And I, I know that uh, people of color, marginalized people, we are called to do nonprofit work just as much as anybody else. And we shouldn't have to pay triple and double the price to participate in the work. Yes, yes. Thank you so, so much. Uh, quick note, our next episode is going to be on non-extractive storytelling. And uh, for today, if you want to make a gift and help us pay our speakers and cover the costs for what it takes to make each episode happen, you can go to opencollective.com slash possibility project. Um, a huge thank you to each of our speakers, all the fantastic disruptors who joined today. We would not be having this conversation and making these moves and waves in the sector without you. So thanks for being with us. Sherry, Dr. Judy and Rusty, you're phenomenal. And I'm gonna let you all go. Hope to see you on the next episode. Thank you so, so much. Take good care.